elementary students, this is Mr. Workman. I'm going to take you through a little lesson here on just uh, bonding in general. We're going to talk about covalent bonding because that's mostly related to uh, our organic chemistry unit here. And I'm also going to take you through, in comparison, ionic bonding so we remember how ionic bonds form. And I'm going to talk to you about uh, Lewis structures and how they can help us predict how many bonds or how bonds might form. So let's get right into it here. First of all, everybody should recall that uh, an atom is the smallest unit of matter that would be indivisible. And this is a sort of generic diagram for what a helium atom would look like. I know it's helium because there's two protons here. Most helium atoms come along with two neutrons, which is why the average atomic mass is really close to four for helium. Uh, and a neutral atom of helium, of course, would have two electrons because it has two protons. And then when you have an equal number of protons and an electron, you have a neutral atom. When that's not the case, when your electrons are not the same as your number of protons, you have what we call an ion. Now, <clears throat> what we're looking at here are some generic Bohr models here of uh, the element hydrogen and the element carbon and the element nitrogen and the element oxygen. And as you can see, here's hydrogen. This little pink thing right here is, uh, is a symbol for its one proton. And it's a hydrogen atom because we've got uh, one electron here. And as you probably recall, this first level of um, electrons, or the first shell as it's called in this diagram, has the capacity for two electrons. The next level has the capacity to hold eight electrons. And we have something called this octet rule that I want to mention to you here. And the general idea here is that atoms will tend to gain, lose, or share electrons in order to have um, eight valence electrons, so eight electrons in this second level. Now, that's um, there's an exception here for hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen will behave so that it'll uh, gain or lose electrons. Normally, what it does is it loses this electron so that its level is full, although it could share electrons, um, or excuse me, lose an electron to make its level empty uh, and become a hydrogen ion, but it could also share another electron somehow and fill this empty gap, so to speak, and fill up that inner level uh, electron shell. Uh, so if these are atoms, these types of elements, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, will gain electrons or share electrons to get up to eight electrons and follow what we call the octet rule. Octet relates to eight, of course. Hydrogen follows something we call the duet rule. So what I want you to visualize here is how many electrons would carbon need to get up to eight electrons in that uh, valence level. The valence level, of course, is the outermost level that we're talking about. Carbon, of course, would like to gain four electrons or somehow share with four other things to get those four electrons. Nitrogen would only need three electrons to get from five electrons to eight. And oxygen would like to gain two electrons to get that uh, second level or that second electron shell full of electrons. So in order to do this, atoms generally will bond covalently, or they will either lose or gain electrons to form ions, and then those ions will then have electrostatic attraction and form compounds. So um, this is really why electrons are important. It, it, how many there are and where those electrons are is going to help us uh, uh, predict how many bonds an atom might form and how many uh, or what type of bonds might form. Okay, so uh, to really figure this out, what we do is draw these Bohr models, and it helps us see how many electrons elements uh, atoms have and where they are. Um, so this is a pretty generic looking uh, diagram here. It's a partial periodic table. It doesn't have all the elements, of course, um, but what it is is it's showing you a simplistic set of Bohr models. It doesn't show how many protons and how many neutrons there are, but it does show how many electrons there are and how many in the various levels. And of course, the first row would correspond with the first electron shell. The second row of elements corresponds with the fact that there are two electron shells. And the third row of elements lets you know that there are three electron shells. And the process uh, repeats down the periodic table. And as you can see, the number of electrons fill. Uh, there's one more electron that fills these shells as you go from left to right across the periodic table, each element. All right, so you can actually track across the periodic table how many elements are in these um, different shells. And as you can see right here, here's an important element, carbon. There's four electrons in the outermost shell. Here's nitrogen. It has five electrons in the outermost shell. Oxygen, here with its six electrons in its outermost shell. Fluorine with seven electrons in its outermost shell. And neon, here's eight electrons in its outermost shell. A total of 10 electrons, of course, counting the two inner level electrons. 
Now that gets a little bit tiresome and tedious to keep drawing all these uh, depictions or full depictions of Bohr models of all these elements. So there's a shortened way we can do it. And the shortened sort of abbreviated way we can do it is something we call Lewis structures. And essentially what a Lewis structure or a an electron dot structure really is, it's just a Bohr model that shows dots on the outside of the symbol uh, and the dots correspond with just valence electrons. Now this is something I tried to put together using, you know, just typing this into uh, the PowerPoint slide here. It doesn't look really good. But in essence, this is an electron dot or Lewis structure for all these different elements that were on the previous slide with the full Bohr models here, okay? So compare this with what I did here. Obviously, here's hydrogen, and it's just showing one dot, all right? Here's carbon, and I tried to show four dots around it. Here's nitrogen, it has five dots around it. Oxygen here, six dots, six dots around it. And the process continues in the pattern that you're all familiar with as you look at the periodic table and the way that I have these elements set up, okay? Now, if you want a clue when you're looking at your periodic table about how many valence electrons, that is, how many electrons would show up in these dots or how many electrons um, would be in the outermost level or electron shell as it's called. You can look at the Roman numerals across the periodic, across the top of the periodic table, or what you can do is look at these Arabic numbers. And in the cases where you have these numbers 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, what you do is you just subtract 10, and that'll indicate to you how many valence electrons there would be. So obviously 13 minus 10 is 3. Here's boron with its three electrons here. 14 minus 10 is 4. Here's carbon with its four dots or its four valence electrons. Okay, so if you want a quick reference on your periodic table, you just look at those numbers across the top. Now, let's review really quickly here what an ionic bond is. An ionic bond, of course, is an uh, electrostatic charge of attraction that occurs between two oppositely charged ions. So I've got a quick little show here for you. Obviously, what, what we have here is a sodium atom and then a chlorine atom becoming sodium ion, or cation, and a chloride uh, anion. And the way that happens, and this can potentially happen, is a sodium can transfer its valence, its one valence electron to a chlorine, and the result is the sodium becomes positive after losing that negative particle, and the chlorine becomes a negative chloride after gaining that negative particle. And the result is that the sodium is positive, the chloride is negative, and they attract to one another and bond to one another in a one-to-one -one proportion. Uh, this is another way of looking at it. Here's a silly little cartoon. One, one dog steals a bone from another dog, and then this dog still wants its bones, but so it kind of hangs out close to the other one. It's a silly little graphic that shows how you can think of ionic bonding. <clears throat> the bones, of course, would symbolize electrons. So another way to look at it, if we we're going to look at Bohr models here, this would be a Bohr model of a sodium atom. Notice it has three levels of electrons. And if it loses this electron, it becomes a sodium ion. And if that electron actually transfers over to the chlorine atom, the chlorine atom becomes a chloride ion. And the result is this is positive and this is negative, and they hang out with one another. They snuggle up real close, and now we've got a sodium chloride formula unit. And if it happens over and over again, you get uh, ultimately a sodium chloride crystal. And that's what this is. This um, The green little circles represent chloride ions, and the yellowish, brown, orangey looking circles represent sodium ions. And <clears throat> what we have here, if you actually went through and counted all these objects, there's an equal number of green circles and an equal number of yellowish, uh, orange circles. And this is because sodium and chloride bond together in a one-to-one -one ratio because they have equal but opposite charges. And they actually bond together geometrically at 90 degree angles, and the outside shape of the crystal is reflective of the inner bond angles there. So if you actually carefully look at salt crystals, this would be table salt, of course, the outer shape of the crystals are actually cubic. Now let's contrast this with what we call covalent bonds. Um, covalent bonds are formed when, not when electrons are taken or given, uh, uh, but rather when electrons are shared, and really the valence levels of uh, bonded atoms literally get close enough to one another so that they intersect, so you get covalence, as the name implies. <clears throat> usually what's happening, um, in contrast with ionic bonds, where you usually get a metal bonding with a nonmetal, in covalent bonds, usually what's happening is uh, nonmetallic elements, or nonmetals, uh, bonding together, and they have similar uh, electronegativity. Not, not huge differences or extreme differences, as are the case with sodium and chloride, for example, or metals and nonmetals in general. What happens is electrons are shared in pairs, and each covalent bond 
we refer to each shared pair of electrons as one covalent bond. Um, oxygen, a diatomic oxygen, carbon dioxide, uh, C2H6 would be a molecule called ethane, water, um, and you know all, these are examples of molecules that can form as a result of covalent bonding. Polyatomic ions that you learned about earlier last semester like phosphate or sulfate, um, all the diatomics are the result of uh, covalent bonds between those atoms or elements that are in those polyatomic groups. This is a little um, diagram of a covalent bond uh, and what you're seeing here if you if we could stop this and pause this and you can actually stop and pause the video and look at this uh, stopped what this is is two oxygen atoms and the reason I can tell it's two oxygen atoms is there are six valence electrons in each of these um, uh, atoms and what happens is uh, they kind of want so to speak now atoms don't actually have sentient emotion so they can't really want anything really but um, you can think of it as that each of these oxygen atoms would like to fill that outer level of electrons to get up to eight electrons. Now realize they both have six electrons already, so they need two more to um, get up to eight. And in the case here, what happens is one oxygen atom would share two of its electrons with another oxygen atom, and the second oxygen atom shares its two electrons back with the first oxygen atom, and they both get two more electrons, so to speak, in that they're both sharing two electrons with one another. And they're both sort of happy, so to speak, as a result. This results in what we call a double covalent bond in between the oxygen atoms. Now, covalent bonds are actually subclassified into what we call polar covalent bonds and nonpolar covalent bonds. This is when electrons, uh, nonpolar covalent bonds, excuse me, nonpolar covalent bonds are when electrons are shared equally between bonded atoms, whereas polar covalent bonds uh, is the result of electrons being shared unequally between bonded atoms. So here's our oxygen atoms sharing a, a, a pair of um, electrons uh, between the um, oxygen atoms. This two oxygen atoms together is when you have uh, an oxygen molecule. So two oxygen atoms combined make an oxygen molecule. And you see how these valence levels literally are intersecting? That's really what we're talking about when we've got covalence going on. So again, I mentioned polar covalent bonds are, happen when electrons are shared unequally. A great example of this is um, in the water molecule. So let me show you what happens here. This is a water molecule, two hydrogens and one oxygen. And what happens is these, uh, the electrons tend to hang out a little more often around the oxygen than they do around the hydrogen. So this side of the water molecule becomes slightly negative, and this side of the water molecule resultantly becomes positive. Now, um, when you actually want to predict how many bonds are going to be made in um, these elements, you can really think of what's called the valence number. And the valence number is really the number of electrons needed to complete those levels. Um, oxygen, I've been mentioning to you, has six valence electrons, so its valence number is two, which of course is the number of electrons needed to uh, get up to eight electrons in that level. Nitrogen has five valence electrons. It needs three more to get up to eight, so its valence number is three. And carbon has four valence electrons, so it needs four more electrons to get up to eight. And again, the valence number will tell you how many bonds each of these elements would potentially make. Carbon makes four bonds because it needs four more electrons to share. Oxygen makes two bonds because it needs two more electrons to share. Nitrogen can make up to three covalent bonds, although sometimes in some rare cases, rare cases these things can make more bonds than what you would think. There's a situation called hypervalence, but we won't even get into that. Carbon is really interesting in the way that it can make its four bonds because it's, um, it can do it in a bunch of different ways. <clears throat> this is the simplest organic molecule that exists, one carbon with four hydrogens surrounding. Notice how it makes these four bonds. Uh, and here is the sort of ball and stick or um, um, three-dimensional model. And these look a lot like the models that you build using our kits here. At school and this is a space filling model which is probably more accurately representative of the overall size and structure of the molecule this is ethane notice how you can get these carbons bonding to one another and chaining up um, this has two carbons and six hydrogens of course this is something called ethene and the reason it's an ethene is because there's a what we call a double bond in between these carbons organic molecules can get pretty complicated again here's methane it's pretty simple uh, here's another look at uh, ethane and ethene. Uh, 
this shows you the tetrahedral shape that we've discussed in class. This would be a double tetrahedron. And this is planar because all everything is all in one plane. There's no tetrahedron, the shape of this molecule. Uh, again, organic molecules can get pretty complex. You don't just have chains of carbons. You can have branch chains of carbons. Carbons can have double bonds between them. Carbons can have triple bonds between them. And then carbons can cycle back on themselves. Uh, and you can have single bonds in the cy cyclic compounds. You can have double bonds in the cyclic compounds. And so as we progress through this unit, we're going to learn more about these different types of molecules and how to name them and identify what they are. And we can uh, project or predict what kind of behavior they might uh, have chemically. So that's it for now. Thanks, everybody. Happy chemistry learning.